when a murder is discovered. And what you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. It doesn't just destroy one life. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else. It's really tough. Well, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. It tears communities apart. When I arrived at the scene, the first thing I went and saw was the body in the wood. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery and track down the killer, but bring them to justice. From a forensic point of view, perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this case is that conviction was achieved without the body. In this episode, the horrendous murder of a retired military man. It was overkill in every sense of the word. It was like someone had lost literally all control, impulse, and just savaged the men. Meet the murder detectives. I've worked over 300 cases as a lead investigator. This case takes the cake. Who reveal how they caught the killer. You know, that old saying, there's no honor among thieves? Well, that also includes prostitutes. Sacramento is the capital city of the US state of California. In 1991, it was a troubled city, reporting more than 100 murders. On March the 7th, Detective John Cabrera got a call about a homicide that would baffle all involved. I was home and had just finished dinner with my family, and uh, I was on call which we are on in homicide, we're basically 24 and seven. So I just get all my equipment and everything I need and I got in my car and I headed out to the crime scene. What John had been told was a body had been discovered concealed in a small closet in a mobile home. There he was, the victim was lying on his stomach. He had a white plastic bag tied around his head. He was just bloody uh, all over all over the place. I started looking at him carefully and I could see stab wound after stab wound, multiple stab wounds. Also at the scene was Deputy Coroner Jesse Villalobos, who examined the lacerations on the body. They're so numerous I didn't bother to count. It was evidently of a puncture wound of some type. That was consistent with the scene that I saw outside. If you're being stabbed repeatedly and fighting off, there's going to be blood scattered, spread, just shed everywhere. John had been told the victim was a 58-year-old male named Philip Inhofer. Tony Harvey, a local journalist, picked up the story. Mr. Inhofer was a retired military man. He worked here in Sacramento at the uh, McCullen Air Force Base. I think he had just retired from the Air Force and he was working as a civilian. The person who had notified the police was Philip's son. He had a call from his father's work to say he hadn't shown up. His son, Henry Inhofer, found a body March 7, 1991. And what, he walks into the mobile home and he finds his dad naked with a plastic bag over his head, bleeding everywhere just terrible the way he died, horrible the way he died. You know, especially, you know, one of your family members, your oldest son, who walks in and he finds you in this state. He didn't see a lot of his dad when he was growing up because his dad was in the military moving around. So they didn't have the greatest relationship at this time. And since Philip Inhofer had moved to Sacramento, this was his opportunity to bond with his dad. Then the next thing you know, you find out that he's dead. Philip's home was in a mobile home park in North Natomas, seven miles from downtown Sacramento. On the night I came out here, it was cold, it was dark, and it was nothing like it is today. This mobile home park sat out here by itself. And so if you're ever gonna commit a crime, what better place where you had nobody around? 
secured the crime scene and he and his team searched it for clues as to what may have taken place. There was a large blood stain in the carpet. And as I started to scan in the room and looking up at the ceiling, I could see blood all over, little drops of blood. In fact, there was a mist of blood on top, which is significant to me because it tells me he was hit with something so hard that the blood basically vaporizes and flies up and then sticks to the walls. It was clear Philip had not been killed in the closet where he was found. John was keen to locate where the initial attack may have taken place. So I moved on, I looked into the bathroom, and there it was. This bathroom was just full of blood. The shower curtain had been sliced or cut, and there was blood all over the walls inside the tub, blood on the floor. So I knew this was where everything happened. Although horrific, this type of random killing wasn't unusual in Sacramento at the time. There was a series of homicides that pretty much ripped the uh, city apart and uh, was just changing the whole culture of uh, how we were living here in Sacramento. And most of these homicides were committed by uh, serial killers. Shootings, you name it. I think 93 is when we set a homicide record for Sacramento. I think it was like 165 homicides, both city and county. Detective John Cabrera and his homicide unit down at the Sacramento Police Department were working most of these crimes, and they solved just about 90% of those crimes. Literally, I spent half my career working murders. Everything from shootings, stabbings, probably some of the worst types of murders that anybody could imagine. I've worked over 300 cases as a lead investigator. This case takes the cake. The crime scene shocked everyone, including Deputy Coroner Jesse Villalobos. You just looked up and you saw blood everywhere. So right off the bat, you said this is unusual because most people don't expend that much effort to kill another human being. There seemed to be no thought about consequences. Definitely the killer knew the victim. It was obvious the, the point of murder was actually in the bathroom or in the shower. So that would indicate that the victim was quite comfortable with the killer around the premises at the time and he was in the shower. So there would be a level of comfort, almost friendliness, the victim and the killer. It was just unbelievably horrific. They weren't just stab wounds. I believe his skull was fractured, if I remember correctly. Whoever had done this, had to have enough energy and strength to drag the victim, and he wasn't a small person. John believed the killer must have been physically tough to overpower Philip. The blood on the floor provided the team with clues to Philip's last movements. The nature of all that blood means it was a very violent encounter, and it also meant that he was struggling for his life. He just did not suddenly go down with the first couple of attacks, whether it was a knife or the bludgeoning. He definitely fought. I started to piece together that if the victim was taking a shower, then the perpetrator would have had to attack them, first of all, in the shower. And then it looked like the victim stepped out of the shower, possibly to defend themselves, reaching out at the person who was attacking them. And by doing so, was flailing blood all over the bathroom, all over the sink and a pair of glasses that had belonged to the victim was lying on the sink. It appeared that he never even had time to put his glasses on. A good deal of homicides actually aren't planned. They are spontaneous events. And so unless you're somebody that routinely walks around with a weapon, for example, a knife, then you would just be picking up something that was to hand. Knives are readily available inside people's homes. It's more suggestive of a determined effort to kill if you're using a gun or a knife. It takes a lot of energy to kill someone that way. So you have to have a lot, a lot of rage, hate, anger, whatever you want to call it. It's work. It 
was clear that the murder had been violent, but John had no idea of a motive. The only possible clue was that Philip's son had revealed his father's car was missing. Mr. Hinhofer's car was a 450 SL Mercedes-Benz. He always parked it in the carport. The neighbors always saw it. What was unique about the victim's Mercedes-Benz? The numbers on the license plate started out 666. Could this be a motive for the murder? It was clear there was more to this case than met the eye, and the team were no closer to catching the killer. I knew this was going to be a real jigsaw puzzle. John had to get justice for Philip Inhofer's murder, and the clock was ticking. Fifty-eight-year-old Philip Inhofer had been brutally murdered in his mobile home in Sacramento. His car was missing, but other than that, lead detective John Cabrera didn't have any clues. What was the motive? Why would someone bludgeon this victim so horribly? What was it? I didn't see the possibility that it was a robbery murder because I didn't see any of the drawers ransacked or pulled out. When examining the crime scene, it became clear the killer had attempted to cover their tracks. They tried to fix it up enough that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. You see all of this blood, but then it's cleaned up. The attempt to clean is an interesting one. It's almost as if the person was then showing remorse. The theory behind covering the victim's head is that they don't want to personalize the damage that has been caused or personalize the victim. John and the team collected telephone records and notebooks from Mr. Inhofer's home. But there was no murder weapon and little in the way of forensic evidence. Only one thing gave John hope. While in the bedroom then, I looked on the nightstand, and there I found was a piece of paper with the name Jade Cabinet. And I thought this is significant because this person was somebody known or maybe somebody special to the victim because it's right here on his nightstand. Why would you have somebody's name, phone number, if it wasn't somebody that you maybe had contact with? They had their first lead. John and the team needed to find Jade Cabadine, and this experienced team knew just how to do it. In these types of homicides, you first work from the inside out. You know, we have to start talking to family. You have to start talking to immediate neighbors. John interviewed Philip's devastated family and had no reason to suspect them. A small break came when he spoke to Philip's next door neighbors. It was late in the evening on March 5th, and he and his wife were sitting in the mobile home park, and it's so quiet out there, but he was hearing a banging noise. And he thought, what is going on so late at night? So he actually stepped out of his mobile home and walked over toward the victim's mobile home, which is where the noise was coming from. And he heard this thump, thump, thump. And immediately I thought, it was probably the assailant beating on the victim, Mr. Enhofer. This theory tied in with the evidence of the attack Deputy Coroner Jesse found on Philip's body. It's a big flat blow, like a stick or a bat, for example. If you hit someone, you'll see it. There's all the associated marks. You'll see contusions, big, massive bruising. The statement from the witnesses gives me a, a window of when this murder might have occurred. It was March 5th, late in the evening, almost midnight. John may have nailed the timing of the murder, but the motive was still a complete mystery. He widened his search for suspects. Perhaps somebody known to Philip had a reason to kill him. As the days went by and we were gathering more information, of course, we were starting with relatives, people that knew him, close people, people at work, people that might have had a problem with him. Nobody, nothing. I mean, what we did find out is he was a gentle person. He was kind, a loving father, a loving grandfather. It appeared he had no enemies. He was just a good man. 
think it's less the character of the victim and more the lifestyle of the victim that's probably quite important to the police. So they do something called victimology, which is basically they explore as much as they can about the victim's life, lifestyle, background, habits, sorts of places they go, where do they spend their money, what do they spend it on, who are the people that they communicate with, who are the people that they meet face to face with. Usually indicates how a person lives will give you an indicator how they died. Nothing made sense. John began to research Philip's private life to see if there was more to this ex-military gentleman than met the eye. When he retired, you know, he got himself a good job and he moved into a mobile home park and he wanted a peaceful life. He wanted to have some company. And he went out with a lot of people from his work, but for some reason, he just seemed to gravitate toward women that were part of an escort service. People do use prostitutes. In fact, on an astounding level, facts and figures of prostitution usually knock people off their feet because it's much more prevalent than you realize. The victim was certainly someone who was going through a midlife crisis, but he was a goldfish in a very deep pool and was going to be hooked by the perpetrator. There's no true love in these uh, relationships. This is pure business. This revelation shed new light on the investigation. If Philip was using call girls, he'd opened himself up to a dangerous world. The use of prostitutes is not like going to the dentist. Unfortunately, what comes with it is the background of the illicit side of prostitution, the pimps, the use of force for money, the fact that really they're only interested in your money, not in you. And that is sometimes very difficult for people who use prostitutes to understand. John started to suspect the name on the nightstand could be connected to Philip's use of escort services. I asked some people if they knew who Jade was. No one knew a Jade. No one. We knew the women that he did date, but no one knew this person who went by the name of Jade Cabotting. With an all-points bulletin known as an APB out on the Mercedes and dozens of statements already taken, John turned to Philip's phone records for clues. One call stood out as a number Philip had no connection to. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna call this phone number and I'm gonna ask him, what is this phone number doing in a dead man's phone bill? And I asked if he knew a person by the name of Jade. He said, I do recall a person by the name of Jade. And I do remember she used my phone to make a phone call to an individual down in Sacramento whom she says she was going to visit. The man on the phone told John that Jade had been in a car accident and that he had stopped to help her. It's there she started to talk about who she was, you know, her name Jade, and that she was going to Sacramento to pick up her Mercedes Benz. And I kept asking him, what other information did he have on this person, Jade? And he said, well, she told us that she was a prostitute, that she worked at Mustang Ranch. There, I just felt a good amount of evidence and clues had been obtained. John had struck gold. The witness connected Jade to the missing Mercedes and gave John a lead on where she worked, the Mustang Ranch. This is the first legal brothel in the United States of America. Mustang Ranch is a very well-known brothel in Nevada, just outside of Reno. I've heard the name and I've known that it existed since I was a young teen. John discovered Jade was a licensed prostitute and a driver's ID had been used to register this name. John hoped this would lead to her true identity. And now I was able to put a face to Jade. And I was actually able to find out who Jade was. Jade, in fact, was a Michelle Comiskey, a 19-year-old 
prostitute. She was about five foot six, she was tall, green eyes, very attractive, and she got what she wanted, and she used her looks and her sex appeal. I don't think these men knew how old she was. But as Mustang Ranch was in the neighboring state of Nevada, John called in a favor and got Reno homicide detectives to escort him to the Mustang Ranch brothel. Well, the first time we all walked in, the girls got up out of the bar area and all started walking toward us, lining up. And of course, we were like, no girls, we're law enforcement, so, you know, take a seat. You know, that old saying, uh, there's no honor among thieves, well, that also includes prostitutes because the information we were able to obtain from those that worked around her was enormous. John learned that at just 19, Michelle had already been married twice and was rumored to have tried to kill one of her husbands. Since then, sex and violence seemed to follow her. Comiskey was very comfortable in a world of violence and fear. She didn't actually have very much empathy, but she had that psychopathic ability to charm. She had that power over others that she could abuse to the hilt. We were starting to find out things that she was talking about, and it kept coming up. She kept talking about this fella that she had down in Sacramento, and he had a Mercedes Benz, and she was gonna get the Mercedes Benz, even if she had to kill for it. With all the stories John had heard, he had one question on his mind. Was this a Black Widow type killer? A serial killer? Only a 2,000 mile hunt would reveal the answer and the truth about this woman, soon to be known as the Batgirl. John Cabrera's investigation of the murder of Philip Inhofer had led him to the infamous Mustang Ranch brothel in Nevada, where Jade, real name Michelle Comiskey, worked as a call girl. The evidence so far was pointing to the 19-year-old escort having killed Philip in order to steal his car. She apparently was driven to the point where whatever it took, she was going to get this Mercedes-Benz. Philip Inhofer, he was spending loads of money on her, buying her clothes and, you know, jewelry and all type of materialistic things. But she wanted that car. And she kept him busy with her sex appeal. Escorts at the ranch told John that Comiskey had grown up in Iowa. I was just startled by how much she had done since the age of 14. She was a runaway at the age of 14. She took off to Florida on her own. But she was able to survive and she survived by using whatever means necessary. And if it meant prostituting herself, well, that's what she did. Some say she was kind of dingy out of her mind. Others say she was bright and intelligent. The last thing is she was just a dreamer living in a materialistic world. First husband attempted to attack. Second husband, she attempts to kill with rat poison. They actually saw Jade putting the rat poison and her husband's food. She began in an awful way to learn how to manipulate others using her sexuality. She could get favors for sex, and this was a very crude learning curve that she continued throughout her life. By the time she was an adult, her sexual prowess and her ability to manipulate people using those skills was phenomenal. I think she started drinking and taking drugs before she left Iowa. And later on, you know, it leads to marijuana. Marijuana leads to cocaine. Cocaine leads to LSD. And then it leads to this person named Jay Kabating that she created. According to colleagues, when Comiskey was working as Jade, she would often do several hits of LSD and still work the night. LSD is classified as a hallucinogenic and its effects are specific to the individual. If they have a lot of rage, it can release that. It depends solely on the person's mental status and the issues they have. Was she capable of doing this? 
She talked about it, LSD, methamphetamine. Now looking at the crime scene, there was no doubt in my mind. Yes, she was very capable of this. Further investigations revealed Comiskey had previous history with men and their mercs, but John needed more if he was going to get an arrest warrant. He spoke to every known associate of Jade's until he got what he was looking for. We had found her former roommate, and that was huge. But what she told us was just incredible, that she had picked up Jade, or as we know, Michelle Comiskey now, and March 5th, drove her down to Sacramento to Mr. Anhofer's mobile home. The former roommate turned against Comiskey and was happy to reveal all about the trip, including a stop at a hardware store where the young prostitute had a rather strange request. Jade made an inquiry about some decon rat poisoning, and she'd asked the clerk, if you were to give this to someone, would it make them sick? And he said, yeah, I believe it would. You know, why would you ask those questions? John had heard rumors that Comiskey had previously tried to kill her former husband using rat poison. It was all making sense. Now she was able to put Jade in her car, driving her to the victim's house, and then leaving Jade there. So now we know who our killer was. But John had doubts about Jade's roommate and fellow prostitute's reliability as a witness. Yeah, what makes a good witness is a really interesting question. Detectives will be making judgments about the kind of background they're from. Are they criminally involved? What was their connection to the victim, to the suspect? Because all of these have implications for the account that that person might give and the sorts of things that they might miss out, actively choose not to include. Although it was hard to believe this sweet-looking 19-year-old was capable of such a brutal attack, John was led by the evidence. On or about March 25th, I was able to secure a warrant for her arrest based on all the information we had. She was now wanted for this brutal murder. The hunt was on. Comiskey's last known address was in Citrus Heights, 15 miles outside Sacramento where it was believed she ran an escort service out of her bedroom. What we found out through the apartment manager is that Jade and her roommate had taken off during the middle of the month without even paying the rent. And apparently they'd loaded up all their stuff and took off. But as far as we were concerned, she wasn't here and she was on the move. Comiskey had been on the run for a month. Finding her was not going to be simple. John called in the FBI. They were able to put out a UFAP warrant, a warrant that the feds use for people that are avoiding prosecution in one state, and they flee. People on the run are good news stories. Um, it makes people want to look and find them themselves. When that person is a very glamorous, sexually overt person on the run, and that person has actually committed murder, you have the two main items that hit headlines, that sell papers. The blonde killer was sure to catch the public's attention, but unless John found solid evidence against her, she could still avoid conviction. He got an address for a storage unit Comiskey rented in the hope it would hold vital clues, perhaps even the murder weapon. Going into the storage shed, it was just a lot of boxes. There was a lot of things that related to Batman, you know, pictures, photographs. We were told about the tattoos. She had a ring of bats around her left arm, vampire bite marks on her neck with drips of blood coming down. She told people she was uh, into Satan and all that kind of stuff. I knew that there wasn't any way we could let this case die. I had to keep it in the newspaper. Years of experience had taught John how to use the media to his best advantage. In an interview with a Sacramento Bee journalist, John had an idea of how to make the story stick. I came up with the name Batgirl. I saw her face light up. And for that brief moment, it was like a, a light went on. 
And uh, she wrote an article about the Batgirl, and it took off like wildfire across the United States. The Batgirl case was the talk of the town. You had to read about it. You had to cut on your television and find out what was going on. She had a big impact on this community at that time. As the nation read about the Batgirl, the FBI used their resources to help gather statements, and John started to pin down where she might be. We did it the old-fashioned way. A lot of footwork, a lot of phone calls, a lot of favors. The network in the US, um, it's just the greatest thing in the world. John believed she was heading to Miami and tracked her route. People would call in Los Angeles and say uh, she was down here, but she isn't here now. Or where did she say she was going? I think she was heading to Phoenix. We'd get a hold of the people in Phoenix. We got calls from Phoenix. Yes, she works for me. And then we also found out that while she was in Phoenix, Arizona, knowing that people already knew about the bat ring on her arm, she had a tattoo put over it covering the bats. But she left the bite marks on her neck. We even talked to the tattoo artist that did that. But they all had different names. She gave them all different stories. More than a month had gone by, and despite all the media attention, John and the team seemed to always be one step behind the backo. You learn in homicide, you can never become frustrated with anything because sooner or later, something's gonna give. These criminals are not foolproof. Someone's gonna recognize them, but they're just gonna make a mistake themselves. And in this particular case, lo and behold, Michelle Kaminsky made the fatal mistake herself. I was at work in the homicide unit on May 7th, 1991. My supervisor told me that Michelle Kaminsky had been arrested in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I thought, good, now it starts to come to an end. Will the Batgirl confess to her crimes? And has John got enough evidence to convict her of Philip Inhofer's murder? Nineteen-year-old Michelle Comiskey, a.k.a. Jade, a.k.a. the Batgirl, was wanted for the murder of Philip Inhofer. She'd been on the run across America when her and a girlfriend were spotted having mechanical issues with their rental van in Biloxi, Mississippi. As luck would have it, just that time when they pulled over to check on what was going on in the back, the police officer sitting across the street. The officer asked Michelle Comiskey for ID, but she didn't have any. He then noticed a Mercedes-Benz in the back of the truck. It had been resprayed and didn't have any number plates. Probably Michelle didn't realize you can take the license plate off a vehicle, but every vehicle has a VIN number. That VIN number was in the system. The officer ran the VIN number, and sure enough, the car belonged to murder victim Philip Inhofer. At that time, he got back out, walked around, asked both girls to step out, and then he took both of them in custody. John had caught his killer and found the car that connected her directly to the murder. But there was still a long way to go before she could be brought to justice, and the public were watching. Everybody had to know what was going on with this thing. I go to the newspaper, hey, what's going on with the bad girl today? I mean, when she was caught in Mississippi, in Biloxi, Mississippi, I mean, Biloxi is known to have strip clubs and casinos. I believe she probably just stopped there to work for a couple days and then she was going to move on. Comiskey had run out of luck. Although John was confident of her guilt, without a murder weapon or forensic evidence, proving it in court could be difficult. What John needed was a confession. It's very critical when you take these people into custody that you're able to get to them and interview them before they have time to sit or to listen to a jailhouse lawyer or someone that's gonna tell them, don't say a word, don't do this. My job is to get there and to try to get her to talk to me. So I was on the plane the next day and I was headed to Biloxi, Mississippi. John was hoping he could get the Batgirl to waive her rights and talk. As an experienced detective, he had a few tricks up his sleeve. She was thin, she looked wiry, 
and uh, she looked very capable of handling herself. I gave her her Miranda rights. I gave her an opportunity not to speak to me, but she agreed to speak with me, giving up her rights. In America, detectives are really good at getting suspects to waive their Miranda rights, which is your right to remain silent and your right to have a solicitor present. But by getting suspects to waive those rights, detectives then have a kind of inroads to interrogate their suspect. And the first question I asked her, I said, are you Michelle Comiskey? And she looked right at me and she said, I don't know who I am. And immediately I thought, here we go. It's game time. I just looked straight at her and I asked her, did you stab Philip Inhofer? She wouldn't answer. She wouldn't answer. What she would tell me is that she hurt him. She admitted to being with Philip that day and that they'd been shopping. She then revealed her version of events the night of Philip Inhofer's death. We're going to take a shower. And then she says, you know, Philip's in the shower and I take LSD. She must have took large doses of this drug. And all of a sudden, she started having these psychological effects. I start to see a monster. And when I go into the bathroom, I see this monster. I see these snakes coming out of its neck. And Satan tells me to hurt this person. And that's what she told me. Satan told me to do it. Satan told me to hurt Philip Emhoff. That's when she went to work on him, you know, with the knife. But she never told me she stabbed him. When I asked her about the taking of the Mercedes, she said, well, Satan told me to take the car because the license plate was 666. And I thought for a moment that she was trying to spin something in this interview, like she was out of her mind, she didn't know what was going on. But you know what? She kills him. She stabs him 32 times. She breaks the knife off in his chest. Then she beats him with the baseball bat. After that, what does she do? She have enough sense that now she's cleaning up the crime scene. She didn't just go goofy and run out the door and get in the car and take off. That's what you would expect. She does that. And then meticulously loads up the car with all the evidence, all the bloody towels, puts her suitcases in there and drives away. So for me to think that she was on LSD, she didn't know what was going on, she was out of her mind. I didn't buy very much of that. There was no doubt that she went to the house that night with the sole intention of committing the murder and stealing the car. Her actions then become erratic. It appears that she had sexual intercourse with the victim beforehand and then engaged in this violent attack with no remorse. Kamiski's statement was damning. John flew the Batgirl back to Sacramento on a first-degree murder charge. When John arrived in the city with Jade in tow, the media went wild. Bringing Jade back after she had been arrested, I'll never forget, it was just uh, unbelievable. Everybody wanted to get a glimpse of this young girl. Since Sacramento was becoming accustomed to these type of crimes, you had to know what was going on. Jade was in jail and she wasn't allowed to have bail and that's because it's a murder charge and in most murder charges you don't have bail. So she was going to be housed in there all the way up until her court proceedings. The Batgirl may have been in custody, but John's work was far from over. He had to gather as much evidence as possible to secure a conviction. Philip Inhofer's stolen Mercedes was his first port of call. It appeared to be like bloodstains in the back carpet. And that would make sense since she said that she threw these bloody towels in there. In the cab of the rental truck, I found an aluminum baseball bat. It appeared that there was smudged blood on it. And then it just struck me. This is the weapon she used on the victim to smash his face in. John also found a briefcase with more vital evidence. 
It contained a ledger listing all the hundreds and hundreds of men Comiskey had slept with for money. And whose name did I find? I find Philip Inhofer's name in there. In the amount of money, $500. This evidence further connected Comiskey to Philip. It seemed the Batgirl's days were numbered. I was told that it was going to be a death penalty case. She killed a victim for his car, and that's how it was going to be presented. And death penalty cases in California are usually around first-degree murders. It would depend on the level of severity because a murder is still a murder, but was it premeditated, was it planned, was it connected to gangs, or was it an instantaneous act? Michelle Comiskey, a.k.a. Jade, was first put in front of a grand jury to decide if there's enough evidence to go to trial on a charge of murder. Michelle pleaded not guilty. She just sat there motionless. She uh, was dressed up in a dress, nothing flamboyant. It looked like a girl going to Sunday school. The grand jury sat for six weeks and was presented with all the evidence John had acquired. The baseball bat, the witness statements, the ledger, and the blood in the car. Their conclusion was that there was enough evidence to go to trial. She was held over to Superior Court uh, to stand trial for first-degree murder. It was during this period, as both sides prepared, that they agreed to a plea of guilty and a sentence, which would enable her the possibility of being paroled somewhere in her life. Comiskey had made a deal that admitted her guilt and sentenced her to 26 years to life in jail, saving her from the death penalty. It also meant that this case would not be in a courtroom, that there would not be a jury of 12, that there would not be media in the courtroom. It was a result, but not one that pleased everybody. I think the family members and I think people that knew him, friends, were very disappointed. And I think they really wanted her to serve life. And in some cases, people thought she should be on death row. Journalist Tony Harvey wrote to her in jail to request an interview. And on his third letter, she replied. These are her words. I live with my murder of Mr. Inhofer every single day. As the years go by, my understanding and reverence for his life gets deeper and sadder. I took this man from his family, friends, and everyday living. He deserves life. Every time I come up for parole, I victimize them all over again, making them relive the horror. Sir, I am not the same young woman. Today I am full moral knowledge of my actions. This sounds like a woman who wants to be free. My personal opinion on, on people is simply this. Everybody can kill. Given the right circumstances, anybody can kill. It amazes me that more humans don't kill each other. I'm so glad that we were able to take her into custody because who knows where it would have ended up. Well, some people ask me, do you think she would have become a serial killer? You know, a serial killer doesn't have to kill three people. It was just a good thing that we were able to take her out of society. There isn't a day that I don't look back, given we didn't have the technology that law enforcement has today, but we gave it our all, and using what we had, we were successful. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs>